let's start the day right now uh, with Don and Bronwyn uh, to talk a really important subject about um, <laughs> what we're sharing online in the life in the life of our kids and the important message for parents. So please welcome uh, Don and Ronnie, and I'm making you uh, organizer. Ready? All right. <laughs> wow, this is so cool. Um, I'm just gonna take a picture so that the internet can see it forever and I can remember it. So thank you, Denis, for creating such beautiful images at Hackfest 2019. Just before we start, a quick disclaimer. Everything that we cover today is, is our opinions and does not reflect our schools, employers, or volunteer organizations past, present, or future. Hi, um, I'm Bronwyn. I have over 15 years of experience with parents, teachers, siblings, and peers. Dance has been a big part of my life since I was three, and I have volunteered and performed professionally at the Hamilton Art Gallery, Hamilton Place, and Dusk Dances. I also have an interest in computer science, psychology, and sociology. And I'm Don. Um, I have tw over 25 years of experience in IT, primarily in critical infrastructure. Today, I work as a healthcare profession security professional. I volunteer uh, with C3X, the Canadian Collegiate Cyber Exercise, as both a builder and mentor. Uh, I uh, Last year, at Besides Toronto, I was part of the organization team that started the first Hack for Kids Toronto. And I lead the black and white group at the Latau Photographers Guild. Um, so I teach dark, black and white like darkroom techniques in what little spare time I have left. Most importantly, I am a partner to my best friend and parent to two awesome kids. I remember one day after school, I came home and said, hey dad, isn't it amazing how people ne name their Wi-Fi access points after their real name or street address? It was that curiosity that started the, a number of discussions that have led us to this talk. Uh, what is important here is not that it, that it is not possible to understand the challenges that teens experience when we view privacy and security. She's the expert. I'm just here for the trip. We're going to cover a number of topics, but to break them down, there are only two major categories, oh, no. schools and peers. Then we will cover what can go wrong and finish with survey results and conclusions. Uh, just a quick note, you do not need to capture any of the links or references. There will be a list at the end and we will share it in the Hackfest Discord. The main point we're trying to make here is that privacy is the right to be left alone. As defined by the Harvard Law Review in 1890 by Warren and Brandei, sometimes we aren't given the choice. According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the General Assembly of Human Rights of 1948, privacy is a basic human right. This concept has roots in classical Greek and ancient Chinese culture, along with mentions in the Quran, Bible, and Jewish law. However, times change and privacy is no longer seen that way. In fact, a VPN provider called Hide My Ass did a survey on privacy stigma and came to the conclusion that people believe all privacy advocates are paranoid male loners with something to hide. When you consider this image of the International Association of Privacy Professionals 2020 annual conference in the European Union, we can clearly see that all privacy advocates are male loners, except the ones that aren't male. The computer science and IT and InfoSec industries have a long way to go to balance the gender, balance, gender diversity the way that the privacy world has. There are two primary federal privacy laws in Canada. The Privacy Act covers federal and federally regulated handling information. PIPEDA covers private businesses, except in Alberta, BC, and Quebec, oh, and charities, not-for-profits, political parties, associations, and a few others. This week was a, a very exciting week in the world of privacy law, for how exciting privacy law truly is uh, for some people. Bill C-41, an act to enact two acts was about acting on privacy, was enacted or released, or maybe it was acted on. Either way, it's 124 pages that if passed will change the way that consumer privacy and accountability exist in Canada. It's been a long time coming. And if you want some really amusing questions, you should watch the original uh, CPAC release on it. 
the question and answer period is just wonderful. And each province has their own take on them. Jurisdiction is very important to how and when these laws are applied. So as you can see, there are a ton of privacy laws. It becomes a substantial difficulty to figure out how many and where and which one applies. The laws are complicated enough that there is an entire online app to narrow down who you should contact when you have a concern. And to put this in perspective, this narrows it down into things like, is this personal health? Is this an employee? Um, is this something else? Does it, does it relate to your bank? Is it a school? Is it provincial? It just goes on and on. It is so complicated to even figure out who you would contact. The Organization for Economic Development and, and ah, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development produced the guidelines for transborder flow of, of personal data. Pipita based its fair information policy and principles on this, and as have many other privacy laws worldwide. Each is a critical part of applying privacy. Consent is the one that gets the most airtime. Explicit consent, as in you were asked and agreed, likely in writing, or at least clicking the yes, I accept your cookie so you can track me, can I read my article now? Implied consent is based on your actions. You went to a website, yes, you wanted it to send content back to your IP address. The right to be forgotten is a revocation of consent. But unlike, unlike much unlike, or sorry, much like uninviting vampires from your home, it is a hard problem to solve which is why I'm cautiously optimistic about the outcome of Bill C-11. And that one, safeguards, and only that one, is security. Security and privacy are not the same thing, but privacy definitely needs security, at least as part of the whole. Terms of service are tough. Uh, they are a, click, they are a contract click, typically known as click wrap. Uh, how many of you have actually read the terms of service for Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter? I did. <laughs> Bronwyn's sibling texted me a link to this game asking if it was okay. It was innocuous enough. I mean, who doesn't like dudes in little green hallways? <laughs> the privacy policy was almost had no detail whatsoever. It and it took a, a substantial amount of time to find the the full policy, which was owned by the parent was hidden by the parent company and located in another country. I'm not going to name the country. You can look it up for yourself, that's your choice. Legislation is challenging and is changing how policies must be written. And, but, but instead of almost unreadable pseudo legal language, we, they have moved to forcing you to read between the lines, making it difficult to understand the intent. And as we can see by the, this list of, acti of, of things that were captured with this particular application, the data that's gathered is a fairly good start to profiling the user. When you ask the question, what is the imprecise location of your mobile device? According to Google, as it relates to the Android operating system, the course location is approximately equivalent to a city block. Today, Google identifies this as dangerous data. This wasn't always the case. At one point, Google didn't think this was dangerous data, and Apple devices, until recently, didn't identify that there was even a, set, a setting to limit precise location data. When is data disclosed? All the right times. Protect us, protect you, fraud, if the government require, is, has a requirement to pull the data from all of its users so that they can build a, build a profile of intellectual property assets to, that they want to invest in. So what about the children? This application is, does not knowingly engage children under the age of 13. Honest, look at the graphics. You can ask it, you need to ask yourselves, how can I teach others to think critically about the terms of service? When Bronwyn turned 13, I gave her a birthday gift, Violet Blue's A Smart Girl's Guide to Privacy. And to be honest, I hadn't actually read it, but it was so well recommended by friends. And to be honest, is my teenager going to actually listen to anything that I have to say? <laughs> so, why not someone who is smart, capable, writes prolifically, and has had to deal with real and online, uh, real life and online stalkers? So, do you think she actually read it? Not so much. How about one chapter? Just one chapter. Social media. Did you read that one? Not exactly. I read the first two pages. 
So I read it. There are bits of it that are out of date, but the advice is sound and it should be required reading for any team, for every team. And your sibling read it when they turned 13. All of it. On the other hand, outsmarting your kids online is a completely different matter. The only way forward is to build trust and you have to have an open and collaborative relationship. While I am still the parent, <laughs> my kids need to feel safe enough to disclose when something isn't right and discuss a reasonable path forward. I had suspected that Bronwyn had never actually read any of the Violet Blue Book and we had already talked about understanding the terms of service uh, before you sign up for an account. And when it came time to set up her first social media account, we read through them for Instagram together. So what did I do next? Well, whatever every parent should be doing. I opened up in my own Instagram account and followed her because that doesn't sound creepy. Some things my friends say often is, why would you read the terms of service? No one reads them. According to a survey of my peers, only 48% of them say that they read the terms of service in some way, and 31% of them also believe that they own what they post on social media, which makes me think that they actually haven't read the terms of service or they didn't understand, which is a different problem. One of the hardest parts about living in a privacy conscious household is that my peers and my friends don't understand at all. I try not to bring up privacy related conversations with them anymore because they don't hold the same beliefs as me regarding it. Some things that my friends have said to me are you, they are only watching you, which I think is hilarious to say, um, or this is the world we live in and there is nothing you can do to change it. Also very hilarious. Um, most of my friends just think I'm paranoid Recently, some of them have started to notice things about targeted advertising, Taylor pages on their social media. However, when I try to bring it up with them and discuss, they shut me down. They don't want to talk about it. This has been an ongoing problem for InfoSec professionals for years. How do we convince them to care? What is it going to take? What would it take to change their behaviors? Social media is a part of daily life as a teen and the same for adults as well. For some, it is really hard to live without it. There's a lot of pressure to be online all the time and to always be checking and seeing what's new. When I came to high school, a lot of people would ask others for their Snapchat. This was an issue because I didn't have an account. <laughs> Often people would say something like, you should get it, everyone has it. Which is just, don't follow the herd, don't follow the herd. Um, at one point, I got fed up and gave into peer pressure, downloading the app. However, before I did that, I read through the entirety of the terms of service. So I read through a fairly well-written and convincing argument, trying not to smile outwardly the entire time. It, I didn't actually have a problem with the service. The three things that I asked at the time were uh, a description in your own words of the privacy policy, an article giving examples of how the service, how you would protect or, or secure the service or app, and an article on, describing a breach of the service and what the potential impacts were. Now, after reading the terms of service, I downloaded the app and proceeded to leave it unopened in a folder of stuff I don't touch because I was unsure of whether or not I wanted to allow them access to my data after I found out what they would do with it and how much they would collect. My friends, of course, thought I was being completely ridiculous and that it wasn't a big deal. So one day I ripped off the Band-Aid, opened it, made an account, and only use it once in a while. So what I wanted all along was for you to understand the risks of the service and the methods of dealing with them. Has this knowledge changed how you use the app? Well, I consider who is in the photo, where it was taken, how it can be tied to me, I also think about the content that I like and how it'll f affect my digital profile. So students look to teachers uh, to model behavior and parents. Um, doxing is a public release of often very private information and it can be a very big issue, especially in aggregate. Getting to know students is tough uh, and finding a quick way to build rapport with them is key. To, su to successfully start a new, new sem semester or school year. In this particular case, an attempt was made to build rapport 
uh, and it was a, a great way to share a ton of personal information. So as you can see, we have some uh, details about hobbies, a wedding date, there's an age. Uh, yes, I've redacted a fair amount of this. And there were some additional details about childhood schools, what cities the person grew up in, and what they've lived in. Sorry, we'll give a couple of seconds for people to see. And some more detail covering their educational career. And of course, details about personal interests, including many standard knowledge-based authentication or password reset questions. While it is unfortunate from a security perspective, in many ways, it shows a general perspective of online privacy and a, a failing of awareness campaigns in the security industry. There is enough information here to put together a very good profile to take over a person's identity or accounts. And some of those things that I've redacted out are so specific that you would very easily be able to figure out where that person has either lived, where they live today, or what, where they work. And, well, that's unfortunate. Oh, <laughs> every fall, it's the same thing. Everyone goes back to school, and a few days later, I bring a bunch of papers home from school and hand them to my dad, dreading every minute. <laughs> and every fall, I read them over, hoping that they're going to be better than the last and then I marked them up from front to back. Uh, one of them in particular noted that I was responsible for what my child surfed for when at school. Since I am aware that it is impossible to filter all of the traffic all the time, and I don't sit in my kids' classes. How? Oh, never mind. So my dad hands me these forms, and now I have to take them back to school, all scratched out. And I'm pretty sure that my teachers talk about how my dad does this every year because they give me a look that says, oh, sweetie, I am so sorry. As a security professional, the main challenge that I find with these forms is that they do not allow for a level of choice regarding how my child, how much a child needs to engage online for the purposes of learning. It's all or nothing much like the permission settings when you install an app on some, de some devices. In the new online form, you can't even say that you don't agree. You either agree or the for form is marked as incomplete. Incomplete. The, day, the way that these are written, I cannot in good conscience recommend that any parent ever approve media consent for any child. They are built to indemnify the boards, not to protect the students. It is important to understand consent here. Not providing active global consent does not mean your child cannot take part in school activities. It means that every time one of these tools will be used, active consent directly asking you must be requested. Passive or implied consent, just like reverse back billing, will not apply in this case. When I went to middle school, I logged into my school Google account for the first time and found that my password wasn't working. I asked the librarian and she told me that this, all the students' login passwords were switched to the name of my school. Every single one. And that we weren't allowed to change them. Of course, I didn't listen and I changed my password anyways. When I went to get my school iPad for the first time, they handed them out and asked us to set them up. Now the setup process was funny to me because it wasn't really a process at all. When you first open up the iPad, you get a bunch of pop-ups asking for locations and notification services. Mm, other way around, okay. What I thought was hilarious is that they told us every pop-up, every for every pop-up, click okay, allow, and accept. There are a few issues with this. First of all, there is no way that my teachers would appreciate all the iPads in their classroom going off with the notifications of every single app installed. And second of all, what is it that I am accepting, allowing, or saying okay to? What is the point of having all these pop-ups in the first place if we are all going to click next, allow, accept, okay, finish without even reading it? We're being trained to skip over the details and not be aware of what we're agreeing to. But the problem is they didn't even realize that's what they were teaching us. Don't read it over, just say accept and it'll start working. What am I accepting again? I don't know. Class Dojo. 
Class Dojo is one of the many tools that we've been asked to sign up for. I've been asked to sign up for over the years. Many re, many have reasonable purposes, and each time I drive my family nuts reading through the terms of service. The terms of service I'm picking on so much because it is the only tool that we have directly to review the intent of what the applications and tools that our kids are using uh, is is trying to do. So this one must be good. It's used in 95% of American schools. Once you dig into the terms of service, there is a lack of parent oversight and the fact that it was designed to normalize classroom behavior by automating the task of recording classroom co conduct. As noted in the New York Times, one might wonder who else is asking questions. The Ottawa Citizen had, a, had reports that were that also showing that it was an organized cyberbullying platform with intentions of sharing and, and selling personal information, personally identifiable information. There were a number of other good analyses as well. So I followed up with the school. I received a reply about a week later that there had been a decision not to proceed with the platform. This is excellent. A privacy win for students, reduction of mass surveillance, heck, even the New York Times wrote it up. All good, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I had no idea that my dad had said anything about Class Dojo. I remember someone asked our teacher why we stopped using it. And my teacher responded by saying, there appears to be some sort of privacy issue with it. She looked directly at me while saying so. Someone then asked what the problem was. So my teacher answered saying, I don't know, apparently there were some problems with it. Looking at me in particular. I only found out when I came home and my dad told me he had it banned from the board. Oh, mathematics. Um, for Valentine's Day, my school decided it would be fun to do a matchmaker quiz with all the staff and students. I thought this was a horrible idea, um, but what really got me were the kinds of questions they were asking us. As you can see, the survey is filled out on something similar to a Scantron, which means it must go through a computer system. You can also see that they're asking questions about what you will do when you are out past curfew and how late you stay out on weekends, which are all security risks and can cause someone to be put in danger for whatever reason. Now this got me wondering, is this a school organized quiz or is it from an outside program? I don't know. We did some Googling and found that the survey came from a Canadian website called Matchematics, which has several different matchmaking questionnaires. Naturally, we went looking for the privacy policy. The privacy policy informed us that they do not share or sell any information obtained from the answer form to any company or government entity. And once scanned into their database, the answer forms are destroyed. Now, there are a few issues we had with this claim. One is, yes, they destroy the paper copies, but they still have all of our answers somewhere. And what do they do with the data once it's in the database? How is it protected? And what else are they using the data for? The problem we had, the other problem we had is they claim that they won't give the data to any government entity. But aren't there legal statutes that would make that claim improbable? We decided to email them. And even a later, a year later, we are still waiting for a reply. Sometimes with all the good intentions and the lack of awareness programs, OPSEC gets missed to the point that it puts people at risk. In this case, the requirement was for students to harvest email addresses to help with the National Geographic Energy Diet. Everyone in the household provided a pseudo mail, pseudo mail private address, which was great. And don't get me wrong, the, the energy diet and the, the concepts that are behind it are a great idea. We need to make sure that we are aware of the impacts of global warming and the uh, negative impacts on, the, on environmental spaces around us. So this is a great initiative. It ends up that all of our first and last names were registered by the teacher and fully displayed on the public page. And this would be fine, except when you started to correlate posted works, such as letters to the local newspaper, and a detailed map of every electronic device in our house, making it the perfect level of detail for a home invasion. It 
isn't until after you it, it isn't a problem until after you do some a little bit of google foo or open source intelligence and then you identify the home address of the point and other points of interest but it ends up that you don't even have to do that because there is a fully clickable map on the public main page of the site making it simple to identify the location of the students in their school and this is a school I randomly picked. It's not the school that my kids are at. Nice try. <laughs> uh, but as you can see, it specifically identifies every school that's taken part in that particular region. And it's nationwide. So this was quickly cleared up, but while notifying me, they leaked another child's name in the response. And it seems that I wasn't the only con concerned parent as a result. So with viewing privacy in mind, there are some concerns and the intention of the educator was great, um, but it comes back to the question of why. What is the purpose of this tool? Is it engaged in? Is it enhancing the learning process, or is it an advertising? Is it advertising online for no benefit? In the case of the National Geographic Energy Diet, a deeper look into those pesky terms of service showed that the that it was sponsored by the Shell Corporation. They retain rights in all works posted and get an active active advertising campaign as to how they uh, how they help communities to as it's related to environmental issues distance learning <laughs> the dreadful new normal for many students that is littered with privacy concerns some schools require webcams to be turned on which can cause some issues cameras pick up the in, the home environment the students are working in as well as anyone who may be walking by. Some students are working on multiple devices, some have bigger rooms with more space, some have lots of younger siblings running around. There's a lot, there's a lot that can be exposed to your classroom environment that you normally wouldn't share, which may make some students and families feel uncomfortable. This is especially problematic if a parent, uh, if a parent chooses to photograph their child along with a partial view of the rest of their class and share it on Twitter. And then it in turn, of course, is reshared and retweeted by the Minister of Education. So, One of my favorite stories so far is when my teacher decided to share his screen, revealing an open browser where he was buying a pair of boots. I remember he said, oh yeah, those are the boots I want, and holy fork, that's my credit card number. There was a few times that my teacher was kicked out of the meeting due which may or may not have been because of a DDoS attack on our school. Um, <laughs> students decided to take over the screen during the teacher's absence and play first person shooter games. There have also been several uh, issues where people have forgotten to turn off their microphones, which resulted in some rather hilarious one-sided conversations. For example, when someone was talking to their friend about how they won't be doing any work all semester and will only pretend to pay attention during online class. <laughs> so in this case, this is also from another tweet, um, also from the same particular minister. And if you look carefully, the uh, some of the names are slightly visible. The original image that was posted, the original tweet, was fully um, fully visible and was not da downrest in any sh way, shape, or form. So uh, thankfully, that was taken down, and the and the kids' names were uh, slightly obfuscated. Data is the new oil. This has become the new rallying cry over the, over the last few years. There is so much big money money being poured into data, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, generative adversarial networks. But what does it mean for privacy? <clears throat> Before you, you use or recommend a service, you should always ask yourself, what is the intent of this technology? Who benefits from the information? Does it enhance our lives or the lives of our users? Is it worth the privacy risk to the, to the user? Or is this just self-promotion? Much like fossil fuels that, have, that we've mishandled in so many ways, mishandled personally identifiable as toxic waste and should be treated as such. It's dangerous and it will get you in trouble. It must be handled with care. And this has not been a priority over the past two decades. History has shown that many important things could not have existed without privacy. The Underground Railroad, women's right to vote, labor movements, gay and trans rights, and many others. 
These all started as private conversations. The simple act of being able to decide who you tell something to and when is a very powerful thing. If you haven't watched the Netflix documentary, Get Hacked, on the subject of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, you should. It asks some very pertinent questions. Are we free? Do we really believe that it is our freedom to choose? You never want your company logo to be on a slide like this, or worse, on the front page of the news. Maybe the front page of the business section, but not the front page of the news. So how about something a little bit lighter? What if you posted a joke? You worked at a new startup in 2011, everyone is kind of hip and cool, and the next thing you know, you all have cool titles. One of the folks listed here is a friend of mine who gave, me, gave permission for me to point this out. Bloomberg helped scrape their website and managed to find the chief libation officer, a procurement role only, of course, and the chief rantologist. This will follow them throughout their careers, and it's a good thing it's funny. Clearview AI is a private company that scraped more than 3 billion images from Facebook, YouTube, and millions of other websites. Basically, they took any publicly available image and they sell access to all of our mugshots to government agencies worldwide. Facebook has agreed to pay $550 million to settle a class action lawsuit for the violation of the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. Cameras are everywhere, every mall, library, doorbell, and in my school, there are 54 cameras. I counted them. It's terrifying to think what happens once you enable facial recognition systems across all of them. For example, at the mall, where Cadillac Fairview Malls recently exposed for having cameras in a number of malls across Canada. These gathered facial images of people without consent, including children. Everything has a trade-off. Location services and mapping apps for finding your phone, finding your device, or kind of makes sense. Social media apps start to get questionable. This is a point in time query of my GPS location for Twitter and YouTube. We not only know where many of these folks live, but also where they walk their dogs and what they visit in their neighborhood. The map was produced with the pushpin module of Recon NG, an excellent tool uh, from, I believe it was Landmaster 53. And, uh, and simply turning off the location services on your devices uh, when not needed and removing the EXIF data from your images will stop this. We talked about OPSEC a little earlier. A couple of days after we had Wi-Fi on vacation, I decided to check out our Insta out Instagram. I have it's four followers and I follow six people. What exactly were you thinking when you posted that we were no longer home on Instagram? I just thought, look at these cool pictures. Uh, but insurance, our home is unattended, and you just told 297 of your closest <laughs> friends to go steal our stuff. Well, you know, that was resolved. Parenting problem solved in one, right? Oh, right. That was the day we flew out. Oops. <laughs> Okay, this is a survey of 89 of my peers. 58% appear to be concerned about online privacy. 80% are concerned about the sale of their info, but they make fun of me when I bring it up. The most, the, most of them use and trust Instagram. When you consider issues like cyberbullying, 29% wish they never posted, or issues of predatory behavior, where 10% of the parents don't know that they have accounts. These can be very concerning. What we can see is they don't ask their parents for advice, clearly. There are a lot of rules. And some of them follow them. But since 20% skip the question, it's only really half. Yeah. They get advice from their peers, not from anyone else. <laughs> 
And we can see that the, the dopamine sit, hit system is working very well. Several times a day. 51.69%. <laughs> we can also see that 45% share during their vacations. So we know who to rob. And Instagram, YouTube, and Snapchat are the most popular services, but they don't seem to realize that Google owns YouTube. And the, they use Instagram and Snapchat for instant messaging instead of more secure tools like Signal. But interestingly enough, 62% read the terms of service read the terms of service for instagram but only for is but since only 48 percent responded to that question that would mean only 30 percent read and they trust instagram and fit much a lot more than facebook no, sorry they trust instagram the most and facebook the least it's too bad that they didn't know that facebook owns instagram the biggest surprise of all and this is a huge surprise 23% are actually using 2FA. 52% are using unique passwords. 67% turn off location services. And 79% have private accounts. That, that, one, that last one in particular was very shocking to me. Um, I am sure that there are a number of parents who could learn from this. Assume breach. Assume breach is the model that um, is, is a model that assumes that the attackers are already in the network, they already have your data, and you don't know where they are. And it's the beginning of the threat hunt methodology. In 2014, Home Depot's self-checkout system was breached in all of its stores across North America for at least eight months. Two years later, the Ontario Supreme Court concluded that the breach was responsible, that the breach response was responsible, prompt, generous, and exemplary. They provided free credit monitoring services. That's it. In particular, they identified that compensable injury must be received as serious and prolonged and rise above the ordinary annoyances and anxieties and fears that people living in, in society routinely accept. You should routinely expect your personal information has been breached. Assume breach. Location tracking cross-device sharing, facial rec profiling, re facial recognition, social media scraping, ubiquitous data breaches. Tie these together with a little bit of machine learning and you can identify anonymous, anonymized data. When asked about privacy, so many people say, I'm not a target, I have nothing to hide. It's not about what, you do, what you've done anymore. It's about what can be gleaned from those relationships and how can it be monetized. Privacy is a tool to combat this. If there's no data, there's nothing to breach. What can you do? Stay engaged, timely follow up and follow through when you see something that doesn't make sense. Think critically, never be afraid to ask questions, escalate when necessary, and don't follow the herd. Some things that we've learned along the way. Not everyone will agree with you. That's okay. Trust and communication are key. Trust but verify, understand your risks, what you're sharing and why. Constant vigilance. And dad will always find out eventually. <laughs> so these are all the links. There are three pages. I'll give you a couple of seconds to quickly snapshot them if you really feel that, but they're not clickable here. We're gonna post them all in Discord. There are a ton of links a serious ton of links. We have like two minutes for questions if anybody has a question, I, th I think. And we can just follow up and with questions in the, uh, in the Discord afterwards if that's preference. Um, yeah, so for, for a question in the uh, Discord, uh, what's your... Um, what's your discord id so we can write to you directly so so if people want to write direct question or ask questions directly to you so you won't miss it uh in yep. the so i'm i'm just in as dawn i forget what mine is um zero x six d seventy eight underscore gray underscore violet 
Okay, so we'll follow up with any questions in the Discord afterwards. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to go through this. Uh, I think this is is great for especially parents and kids and uh, and infosec professionals to start thinking about the impacts of awareness campaigns and other things. And we're just we going do to are, we do have a question very fast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, someone asked if there's a really a secure and private app somewhere. Really secure and private app for for what purpose? Uh, it didn't write, but I think it was more like a generic question. Uh, really, is there any way to have a really secure and private uh, app? So that's a really difficult thing to answer because the, the, the simplest answer is there, there are no such things as com completely secure and private apps. Uh, things that are zero knowledge, uh, it, end to end encrypted that would be the beginning of anything that would be truly uh truly uh, tr truly private so the the zero knowledge is key because there's no information that can be gathered between the the uh, the provider and end to end encrypted meaning of course that there's there's no data that's that's captured in transit and preferably would also be encrypted on the device the challenge that you start to get into is whether or not the device is the, is then the point of risk so there's no perfectly good answer. Um, if we're talking about texting apps, uh, I prefer Signal over um, just about everything else. Mm -hmm. The downfall with Signal being that it exposes your cell phone number unless you've gone and registered with, with a VoIP number. Uh, so there, there are always challenges and trade-offs and it's always a, 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 a trick to figure out how to go around that. Uh, if you're looking for a whole bunch of references and recommendations, the uh, Michael Basil has a uh, the uh, it used to be called the Open Source Security and Open Source Security Podcast. Uh, he's changed the name two or three times. Uh, there's uh, he recently did a series of episodes that were uh, a reintroduction of of focusing on privacy and privacy focused and security uh, recommendations and applications and things. The on the extreme privacy end of things, it gets very complicated. And the thing to remember is, if you do one thing that is more private or more secure today, you're better than you were, to, were yesterday. And if you do one thing every day or once, one thing every week, you'll slowly make your way forward and it won't be perfect. And that's okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We'll see everybody in the Discord.